Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar in the CERTIP and ESTCP webinar series. My name is Jennifer Nyman. I am a senior engineer at Geosyntech Consultants in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERTIP and ESTCP. I will be facilitating today's call. The webinar will consist of a brief overview of CERTIP and ESTCP by Dr. Andrea Leeson, followed by a list of upcoming webinars in CERTIP and ESTCP's webinar series. After Andrea's opening remarks, we will transition to the technical portion of the webinar. Today's event features three presentations on emerging contaminants. First, Mr. Paul Yaroshak will talk about the DOD Chemical and Material Risk Management Program, followed by a brief question and answer session. Second, Dr. Jennifer Field will discuss the state of knowledge on per and polyfluoroalkyl substances at military sites. And that will be followed by a second brief question and answer session. We will conclude with Dr. Patrick Evans, who will present an overview of recent and current research on 1,4-dioxane, and then present greater detail on the treatment of 1,4-dioxane and chlorinated solvent, solvents using sustained slow-release chemical oxidant cylinders. We will conclude the webinar with an interactive Q&A session, including all three speakers. And with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Andrea Leeson, who is the Deputy Director of CERTIP and ESTCP, as well as the Program Manager for Environmental Restoration within CERTIP and ESTCP. Andrea has been with CERTIP and ESTCP since 2001. Prior to that, she was a research scientist at the Tell Memorial Institute, where she conducted research on in situ bioremediation. Andrea? Thank you, Jennifer. I'm happy to welcome everyone to CERTIP and ESTCP's webinar today. CERTIP is the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program and was established in 1991 by Congress as a partnership between the DOD, the Department of Energy, and the EPA. CERTIP's mission is to identify and address high-priority environmental science and technology opportunities that focus on DOD requirements. We fund both fundamental research as well as advanced technology development under CERTIP that ultimately impacts real-world environmental management. ESTCP is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program in which we demonstrate innovative environmental and energy technologies. These investments capitalize on past investments under CERTIP or other research programs and are designed to transition technologies out of the lab and into the field. Especially important in all ESTCP demonstrations is the ultimate transition to implementation and regulatory acceptance. CERTIP and ESTCP are complementary programs with much of CERTIP research occurring at the lab and pilot scale with occasional field efforts, while ESTCP demonstrations are primarily at the pilot and field scale, although occasionally supporting lab efforts are conducted. There are four program areas in CERTIP, five in ESTCP. The energy and water program area is only in ESTCP, while the other four, environmental restoration, munitions response, resource conservation and climate change, and weapons systems and platforms are CERTIP and ESTCP programs managed jointly by a designated program manager. Our webinar today is focusing on research and demonstrations that were conducted under the Environmental Restoration Program area. Environmental restoration has essentially five main areas of research, contaminated groundwater, contaminants on DOD testing and training ranges, contaminated sediments, wastewater treatment, as well as risk assessment. Our webinar series will be highlighting research and demonstration efforts from each of the five program areas. As you can see, our webinars will cover a broad range of topics with upcoming topics covering watershed and stormwater management, the vapor intrusion to insensitive munitions. The next webinar based on research and demonstrations that have been conducted under the Environmental Restoration Program area will be on January 14th and will focus on vapor intrusion. You can find more information about upcoming webinars on the CERTIP and ESTCP website. Registration is now live for the next two webinars, the first one on watershed assessment and stormwater management optimization tools, as well as the next Environmental Restoration webinar on vapor intrusion. I hope you enjoy the webinar today, and I'll turn it back to you, Jennifer. Thanks, Andrea. 
Now it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Paul Yaroshek, who is the Deputy for Chemical and Material Risk Management in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense. Paul was instrumental in developing an award-winning program to identify, assess, and develop risk management actions for emerging contaminants. He has a master's degree in environmental engineering, is a registered professional engineer, and is also a graduate of the Senior Executive Fellows Program at Harvard University. Paul? Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be with you this afternoon, especially to give uh, an overview of the DOD Emerging Contaminants Program. It started back in about 2006 with a chemical called perchlorate, and it's since evolved into a larger program we call Chemical Material Risk Management. I'm going to breeze through some of these first slides rather quickly, but I want to expose you to them. Kind of a 50,000-foot view of the program is the fact that all of the equipment, weapon systems, platforms, everything we make for the ward fighter and how we su sustain those systems really depend on chemicals and materials. And given the regulatory climate today, many of those chemicals and materials needed for production and performance of those systems are really becoming more at risk of becoming non-available. And we'll talk a little bit about that here in as subsequent slides. Um, I just wanted to throw up here and show you some of the global trends that we're following and just point, uh, make a couple points. Some of you are familiar with the EPA IRIS program, which is their hazard assessment program. We have a team of toxicologists across DOD that help us review EPA's hazard assessments for certain chemicals and provide science comments on those chemicals. Um, one of the things that's affecting us greatly right now, if you look at the last bullet, is the EPA Chemical Action Plan program under TSCA Section 6. EPA has identified 90 priority chemicals which they're going to assess and potentially develop risk management actions for, which could include um, potentially new standards or even uh, manufacturing bans. One of the first things we did early on in the program is put together a, a, a team with the Environmental Council of States and EPA to look at some of the issues evolving around emerging contaminants. And one of the first things we did is create a definition that you see here on the screen. What's important about this definition is that these are emerging contaminants are chemicals and materials with these real or potential risks, and they either don't have a peer-reviewed human health standard like perchlorate did 10 years ago, or it's a more traditional chemical or material, but the science is evolving, and therefore regulations could change, standards could change. They can affect, these ECs can affect DOD in a number of ways. In particular right now, we're quite concerned about that they may restrict availability or, or cost of our materials that we need to perform our mission. And the thing that I think that this webinar will be most interested in is they also can increase our, our cleanup costs, especially if we have to reopen a site as a result of a new standard or a new contaminant shows up at a site. This is the heart of our program. If you understand this, you really understand everything. It's a three-tiered process we call scan watch action, where we look over the horizon and see things that are changing in the chemicals and materials world. If, there, if we deem that there's a risk to one of five functional areas in DOD, we move that chemical to the watch list in which case we do a qualitative phase one assessment on that chemical. That's about a four-hour drill. It's subject matter elicitation. Out of that comes a risk matrix. If there's a high risk, we move it to the action list, and we do a more quantitative phase two um, impact assessment. What's most important out of this three-phase process is we come out of there with risk management options enterprise-wide for DOD that we take to a governance council. And they can vary anything from major policies all the way to initiating new R&D. These are just the five functional areas assessed. I, th I think they go without much explanation. You can see them. But of course, one of them is the cleanup and remediation field. Obviously, ECs or changes in toxicology values can affect our cleanup program. This is how many we've looked at so far, over, over 580. 
Um, what's most important is the bottom of this slide, which shows you we now have um, 66 risk management actions running. We've completed almost 60% of those. And um, all of the options that we've taken to our Governance Council have been approved. Just some examples of the ECs that can affect drinking water. I'm going to kind of move into a discussion a little bit more now about the cleanup program. And we'll focus, because of today's discussion on PFO and PFOS, we'll, that should read PFOS, by the way, uh, PFO and PFOS near the bottom. We'll, we'll concentrate on that. Just a little history here on PFO and PFOS. You can see on the screen, I won't go through the whole thing with you, but what I want to point out is the two items in red. Back as early as 2007, our Emerging Contaminants Program did a phase one assessment for PFO and PFOS. And at that time, we noted that there would be risk related to PFOS releases because of aqueous film forming foam, that's AFFF. We had firefighting training sites that had used PFOS containing foam, and therefore there were releases of, of PFOS. And then later on, in July of 2011, we issued a risk alert specifically on AFFF, and uh, most recently we've done a cost-benefit study on determining whether we should move some of the old legacy PFOS containing AFFF out of our system. And I'll end up with this because it's really a, a very good executive summary of our thinking that's evolved in partnership with our regulators at a, as to how to handle EC releases. And we've divided it into a series of triggers and actions. And the first trigger, of course, is under CERCLA, if we have a release or a suspected release of an EC, the first thing we want to do is some confirmation sampling and what I would call initial characterization just to determine if there are pathways and receptors. In other words, is, is there exposure potential? The second trigger is if there's a, conf a confirmed pathway and receptor, um, immediately what we'll try to do is take a risk management action by eliminating that unacceptable exposure. And we would typically do that by, uh, by cutting off the path or by even supplying drinking water if, if there were public exposure. And then the third part of this actually involves the site cleanup itself. We typically wouldn't do any large-scale site cleanup until we had a peer-reviewed toxicity standard, such as a reference dose or an RFD. Once that peer-reviewed uh, reference dose is published, our risk assessors can then do a, a risk assessment, site-specific human health risk assessment for that site and determine if there is if there's any action needed. Um, one myth that we busted early on in the program is that you don't need a drinking water maximum contaminant level, or MCL, to take this kind of action. You just need a peer-reviewed toxicity standard because we can use that in the, in, the, in the human health risk assessment to move forward. And then what we would do, of course, is integrate that site into our defense environmental restoration program. And depending on how the risk assessment came out, there would be possible remedial action. So that's a very quick overview of a program um, that's um, worked very well for the Department of Defense. In fact, um, the program received an Innovations in American Government Award from Harvard University a few years back. And I'll turn it back over to you, Jen. Um, Paul, we do have a couple of questions for you. Um, the first question is, um, please discuss your program's position on the precautionary principle. Well, the, as you saw from the slide there, the worldwide trends are such that th the precautionary principle is being used in the sense that we need to know whether a, uh, the human health and environmental effects of a chemical or material before we use them. And um, I think generally we agree with that. Um, one of the things we want to be sure of is if, if there is a chemical or material that looks like there are human uh, health or environmental risks, we want to search for substitutes that have three, that really not only are less toxic, but also that they perform. Um, a substitute has to perform for the uh, purpose that it was intended. And, and a perfect example of that 
is there are important properties with flame retardants. If there are certain flame retardants that have toxic properties and we're going to substitute them, the substitutes have to meet the performance requirement. So the, 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 the overall answer is yes, we do support in general the precautionary principle. Okay, thanks Paul. And can you provide one or two examples of a risk management action completed or underway? Yeah, I can give you a, a real good one. Um, for hexavalent chromium, we noticed that CERTIP and ESTCP had done a wonderful job uh, in the research program of coming up with substitutes for hexavalent chromium in a number of applications, in particular coating, uh, aircraft coatings. However, those applications were not being always used. So um, we developed a very strong policy from the Under Secretary of Defense to ensure that hexavalent chromium was not being used unless uh, a senior executive could prove that the um, alternatives that were out there would not meet the performance requirements. And then we went actually a little further. We produced a federal acquisition rule to prevent hexavalent chromium from coming into our system with new acquisitions. Okay, great. Thank you, Paul. Um, the audience had a question. They said, we understand what gets a chemical into the EC program, but how does a chemical evolve out of the program? Yeah, good example. And, and I think the, the, the best example of that would be perchlorate. Um, perchlorate actually was uh, the initiator of the program, but over about six or seven years, we, we, the Department of Defense, took so many risk management actions that perchlorate is really, you know, I would call it, in our rearview mirror right now. CERTIP and ESTCP did a lot of research on um, natural causes of perchlorate. Um, they did a great job finding um, an analysis, an isotopic analysis procedure that would allow us to distinguish man-made from, uh, from natural perchlorate. And we took over 50,000 samples across DOD of where we, thought, where we thought there might be perchlorate releases. All of those things greatly reduce the risk of, of perchlorate. And so we've actually moved it from our action list back to the watch list where we just maintain an eye on it. Okay. Thanks, Paul. We're going to move on to our second presentation now. Um, but Paul will return for the final Q&A portion at the end of the webinar to answer more questions. And I know we have some um, that, that haven't been answered yet. So our second presentation will be given by Dr. Jennifer Field, who is a professor with the Department of Environmental and Molecular Toxicology at Oregon State University. She holds a PhD in geochemistry from the Colorado School of Mines and was a postdoctoral fellow at the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology. Dr. Field's research focuses on the development of quantitative analytical methods for organic micropollutants and the application of the methods for determining fate and transport of those pollutants. Jennifer? Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, as you can see, this section of the webinar is focused on per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, PFASs, and there'll be a slide coming up why we need to use that term. But it is a pleasure to bring to you today some of the uh, advances funded by the CERTIP program. Uh, here you see the agenda for this portion of the talk. I certainly want to open up with my capable project team and then remind uh, listeners about the unique chemistry of the PFASs and then step through what the CERTIP project objectives approach and results are and then end up with some conclusions and what the benefits of having that information is to DOD. The project team, I am very fortunate to have uh, colleagues from UC Berkeley including David Sedlak and Lisa Alvarez-Cohen on the team and then Marcus Kleber a soil scientist from Oregon State University. Now onto the unique chemistry of PFASs. Most of you already are quite well aware that the carbon fluorine bond is the shortest and strongest bond in nature. And when you look at the structures on the right hand side of the panel, you see PFOS in the upper right, PFOA in the bottom, you see that they're characterized by a large number of those carbon fluorine bonds. And when they're assembled together in a tail, what we know is that those fluorinated tails have less of a tendency to associate either with oil or water. And so we call them both hydrophobic and oleophobic tails, which is why you see the cartoon of PFOS with its tail flipped up into the air phase and the head polar group uh, in water. And PFO on the bottom, you see we've got a carb carboxylate group on top of that um, perfluorinated tail. So with that tendency of the carbon fluorine bond, what we know today is that there are few engineered or environmental degradation processes that act on these chemicals, and that's one of the challenges before us today. And the engineering solutions that we have are very high energy and they tend to be high cost. 
And so these chemicals, because of their characteristics, they have very unique performance capabilities. They're stable in acids, bases, and oxidants and heat, which is why we throw them on burning fuel fires. And that was the AFFF that the previous speaker mentioned. And because that bond is so strong, there's essentially it takes a lot of energy to break those bonds. And what we see that microorganisms simply can't gain energy from breaking the bonds, the carbon fluorine bonds in PFOS and PFOA. So when we think about um, PFOS and PFOA, they're just two members of two families that we're aware of at military sites. And so I want to step back and say something here about nomenclature. There's, there's definitely a need to unify the nomenclature of these substances and the larger um, PFAS term that I used previously. And it's because there's a growing international acceptance of a certain nomenclature. And we have this need to communicate accurately whether you're inside DOD or inside or and, and outside DOD, whether you're talking to stakeholders who include the public or the regulatory community. And so we have to um, embrace uh, the nomenclature that goes with it. So what's wrong with the acronym PFC? Well, most people understand the P in PFC to mean perfluorinated. And that term, if you remember back to organic chemistry, many of you may prefer to forget those days, but if you think about per, it means in the case of PFOS, all of the carbons are fluorinated. And so per is actually, perfluorinated is a very restrictive term, and few of the PFASs at military sites fit into this restrictive defined category. PFOS and PFOA happen to fit into that class. And so you see the structure of PFOS, and then below it um, is a polyfluorinated species. So very similar to PFOS, but the, what you see in the lower structure, which is we call it polyfluorinated, is the two carbons that are in blue, and they're bonded to hydrogen. And so, so why does this matter? Well, first of all, let's look at PFOS. Um, you're just seeing one isomer. We are very well aware that when the, in the nature of the chemistry that created PFOS, um, that it creates branch and linear isomers, and odd and even chain links. So PFOS in groundwater, sediment, soil at military sites is never alone. It's always with its family members, its homologous series that range from C2 up to C10. I would like to note that putting a sulfonate group on a molecule, such as in PFOS, that is a deprotonated anionic form at all environmental and physiological pHs. So that's the relevant species, so it's very water soluble. When I think about putting a sulfonic or sulfonate group on any molecule, it's like strapping on roller skates. The water solubility is very high, and the mobility in groundwater is correspondingly high. When you drop down to the bottom chemical on this page, there you see the polyfluorinated fluorotelomer sulfonate. So this is a polyfluorinated material as mentioned. It doesn't have all of the hydrogens replaced by fluorine. What's interesting to note about those CH2 linkages in blue is they basically represent a weakness in the molecule. And molecules that have this weakness as part of their chemistry and part of that, that tail, they are susceptible to biodegradation and abiotic degradation processes such as oxidation. So moving on, the sort of funded technical objectives are fourfold. One is we wanted to wrap our head around what was the actual composition of AFFF that were used in a historical, repeated fashion for training on military sites and in emergency response situations. The second one is once we know what's in AFFF, what's in the groundwater? And we need to understand what's in groundwater, sediment, and soil um, relative to, to, to AFFF. They're not always the same thing. And then moving on, we need to begin to understand what's the biodegradation of key components in AFFF, ideal under both aerobic and anaerobic conditions. And then lastly, to begin to understand the absorption of some of the new cast of PFASs of characters that we see at groundwater, um, groundwater sediment and soil. So as we move on, the approach is one that you might be quite familiar with. For the analytical characterization of AFFF and the environmental media, we have to use uh, liquid chromatography, tandem mass spectrometry, because these are non-volatile compounds. And there will be uh, two other assays I'd like to mention later that help us understand total fluorine at these sites. So I'll mention an oxidation-based assay and a spectroscopic approach. The biodegradation experiments were undertaken by Dr. Lisa Alvarez-Cohen at UC Berkeley. She used a classic microcosm experiment under aerobic and anaerobic conditions. And then lastly, batch sorption experiments, some of these more interesting zwerin and cationic substances are underway here at Oregon State University. So what do we know about AFFF that were used repeatedly at these sites? Well, a lot of people focus on 3M AFFF. It's an important one. As mentioned earlier, it was one of the first ones to be approved for military uh, use. 
And when we look at what the archive we have of AFFF, we can confirm PFOS was a major component of 3M AFFF. But we recently saw another example of a 3M, we actually don't know the date, where the C6 sulfonate is higher in abundance in the AFFF than PFOS. So there's no one exact formulation. I, my understanding is that these formulations changed uh, over time, and so we're just still trying to collect data on what actually hit the ground. To date, when we look at formulations, PFOA is only a minor component of what was in AFFS. So a lot of the PFOA we see may actually be a degradation product, or there's an AFFS out there that we haven't yet characterized that had a lot of PFOA in it. 3M AFFS have the ultra short sulfonates. I'll mention those a little bit later, as well as cationic and zwitterionic structures. So if you look on the right, you that top structure is a cation. It's a fixed charge cation at all environmental pHs. The second and third chemicals down are zwitterions. They possess both negative and positively charged sites. And so these chemistries were coming out in these PFOS AFFS, and there's also ones not shown on this page that are very PFOS-like, sites of insaturation, for example. And it's simply because, uh, no offense intended, but the 3M chemistry is kind of messy. When we look at the telomer-based AFFS, we see that PFOS was not a component in, a triple F, in the telomer-based AFFS. Uh, we also see that the telomer sulfonates, which are showing up in high concentration in groundwater, are only minor to trace components in the telomer-based AFFS. This is part of this growing hypothesis that the telomer sulfonates are actually transformation products, metastable ones. And telomer-based AFFS do contain cationic and zwitterionic structures as well. So this slide is just a tiny snippet of data. I've picked out two samples from two sites and only a small fraction of the analytes that we actually measure. And what's notable here is I'd like to bring your attention to the uh, values or the components in red. For those of you familiar with the EPA's uncontaminated monitoring, uh, uncontaminated <laughs> UCMR3 list, those are listed in red. So PFBS, the C6, uh, and PFOS, and the C7 and C8, those red materials are listed in the UCMR3 list. And you can see they're here, but so are a lot of other things. And when we think about what's in method 537, that's something people are familiar with as an analytical methodology. The purple components in this table are not in that EPA method 537. So those are little notes. And I'd like to bring your attention to the top two chemicals in purple, that very topmost material. That is actually a precursor in the Ansel AFFF. Here's that telomer sulfonate. Notice those levels in the hundreds of micrograms per liter. Um, and they rival that of, say, the C6 sulfonate. So this is an important species in groundwater. We have to be careful not to overlook. Unfortunately, there's very little tox data on it. When we do look at PFOS, you can actually see that we see up to a milligram per liter in this particular groundwater, 1,000 micrograms per liter. As you'll clearly recognize, this is orders of magnitude above the EPA provisionary health advisory levels. You can see that there's no magic ratio between the C6 and C8 sulfonates. That I brought up a little bit earlier. And the other two components worth keeping an eye on are this PFBS in red and the PFBA in purple. Those values exceed the Minnesota chronic non-cancer health risk limits that they set for the C4 chemicals. And what's important to note is when you're in working with these kinds of sites, so these are AFFF contaminated groundwaters, uh, these systems hold the world's records in terms, at least from our laboratory's perspective, the highest concentrations we've ever measured in aqueous phases. So that's way above landfill leachates and municipal wastewater treatment systems. So we've hit world records of a milligram per liter of PFOS in groundwater, six milligrams per liter of PFOA, and there's that telomer sulfonate, the all-time record holder, 14.6 milligrams per liter. So again, just a note, it's not just about PFOS and PFOA. And here's a perfect example. We recently saw the C2 and C3 sulfonates in groundwater, and we can trace the origin back to AFFS. Here you see them in yellow and green. So they're present there. Again, that's part of that messy chemistry, created a homologous series of compounds. And of course, PFOS is in there as well. And note the log scale. We also see these components in groundwater, as you might expect. They're highly mobile, and they're likely leading at the edges of plumes and likely to first interact downgrading receptors or to migrate off-site. And as very small anions in groundwater, you can recognize the challenges we're going to have in trying to remove them from drinking water source 
materials if we're trying to polish drinking water um, source terms for potential drink drinking water. So these are species to keep in mind if you're de designing remedial um, schemes. Moving on to more site characterization, we're turning our attention to trying to understand the remaining highly fluorinated substances in groundwater. Here's an example of the three species. These are found in groundwater. You can see it, we have the three chemical species here. They might start to all look alike to you, but notice how that looks almost like PFOS. It's a more reduced form. It's sulfinate, most likely a precursor to PFOS. It's seen in 9 out of 13 sites. It's been identified in some biodegradation pathways, and indeed we see it in groundwater. In this particular case, the second row down, we see the, oxy or the hydroxylated telomer sulfonate. How do we know it's an ansel-related product or a telomer based, which is here in column three? There's those two carbons that are not fully fluorinated. That's true in this third chemical as well. So these are originating from telomer based AFFF, whereas this one is a 3M based. And you can see that we're picking them up in groundwater at various different sites. So these are part of our indicators of bio, in situ biotransformation. They're also potential remedial targets when you're considering site assessment and treatment. And they may also be chemicals that, were, that warrant a, a closer look when it comes to assessing potential risk to humans and to, um, to, to wildlife. So why do these other structures matter? They all exhibit high aqueous solubility, low vapor pressures, and so then you're going to recognize immediately they're going to have very low Henry's Law potential. In other words, they're not removed by air sparging. In fact, others have demonstrated they stay behind in air sparged water, so we have to think about that in a mixed system. In terms of transport, I'll touch a little bit later, but anionics are readily transported, followed by zwitterionics cationics. They may, in fact, be ion exchanging to create immobile source zone, something to keep in mind and it's kind of a game changer. In terms of biodegradation, we know a little bit more for some of the anionic species, like say an ansel, but we have um, essentially no data for zwitterions and cations. And as mentioned, there are no natural biodegradation processes that have yet been identified um, for PFOS and PFOA. In terms of tox, we have much more data on PFOS and PFOA, and exceedingly less on the shorter chain materials by comparison and essentially no data on the toxicity of zwitterions and cations. But if we look to cationic surfactants in general, they exhibit uh, greater aquatic toxicity than their anionic counterparts. Okay, this last piece on site characterization, are these individual species enough? Well, there are tools out there that are now becoming more available to try and understand the totality of the highly fluorinated substances. One is the elegant assay created by Eric Houts and David Sedlak at Berkeley, and that was to try and find a more cost-effective tool for understanding if there are precursors or individual chemicals we can't yet identify as individuals using a, a, a bulk approach. And what they did is they oxidized with thermally activated um, persulfate to create hydroxyl radicals, and they degrade precursors in groundwater sediment and soil to these dead-end carboxylates, and they measure the net increase after oxidation. And it's a way to try and understand the materials we haven't yet identified. And this has been applied to show that we, we only know um, a, a fraction of the individual species in groundwater sediment and soil. And Dr. Alvarez Cohen has applied this for understanding mass balance in her microcosm study. Piggy, the second bullet, is an important, um, interesting possibility here. We have total fluorine by Piggy. Um, you can see in the lower right, we get two signals uh, based on gamma ray energy, two signals for fluorine. And what Dr. Graham uh, Peasley of Hope College has done is absorb PFASs from groundwater onto solid phase sorption media, creating a solid target. He actually glues that media in place and then puts that target in front of a beam, an ion beam, and bombards it with protons. And what he gets are these doublet for fluorine, and he gets a signal that's quantitative and quantitatively proportional to the amount of material extracted on that sorbent cartridge. So what does this mean for practitioners in the field? What we may have here is a quantitative and high throughput tool that is uh, vastly less expensive than the LCMSMS, and it could be used to guide and proportion resources appropriately. So what does it mean when we embrace total fluorine, uh, as well as these increasing information on individual PFASs. It is an attempt to close the mass balance. With fingerprinting capability, with so many um, individual compounds being identified, we have the potential for differentiating AFFF sources from other common sources found on bases, including landfills, 
wastewater effluents, and atmospheric deposition that can impact surface waters. We hope this information will help lead to more accurate conceptual site models and understand human and wildlife exposure, and then be ultimately used to help design remedial treatment strategies that are effective, and then ultimately to really drill down on what we're still missing on the transport, biodegradation, and tox of these compounds. So here's just one slide on the biotransformation. This comes from uh, Lisa Alvaro and Cohen's laboratory. Here you see the starting product of Ansel up here in the right-hand corner. And you see the fancy R group, uh, you the head group here uh, that's quite polar. And what we see is those first steps. There's an oxygen occurring on this sulfur atom. Then you see two uh, oxygen forms. You can imagine the water solubility of these forms are going up. And there's the telomer sulfonate as an intermediate in this degradation process. Now this is an aerobic pathway. And under aerobic conditions, they see that this uh, telomer sulfonate goes on to form unsaturated and the short chain uh, stable carboxylates. Uh, so under aerobic conditions, the telomer sulfonate uh, is degradable uh, further, and that's been uh, nicely demonstrated as well by Ning Wang of DuPont. He's also published on the aerobic degradation pathway. But it's important to note, under anaerobic groundwater conditions, this species, this lower telomer sulfonate, is very stable, and we see it in groundwater that hasn't received an AFFF application for over a decade. That's where the term metastable comes from. And this piece on sorption, so we're undertaking uh, looking at this as a mixture, um, a national foam mixture. It has a combination of fluorotelomer sulfonates where the carbon chain is 6 and 8. Here's an interesting zwitter ion, and here is a cation. What we're seeing from bat sorption experiments, the longer the chain link, the greater affinity for sediment. That would be expected from the literature, very nice literature developed by Chris Higgins and others. We also see that the telomer sulfonate is relatively more mobile than PFOS, even though they have the same total number of carbons in their chain links. Zwitter ions are absorbing less than anions, possibly due to the enhanced polarity of the uh, head group. And then cations are actually removed entirely from solution, which is, again, ho helping to inform this hypothesis. There may be source zones where these cationic forms are um, still in place. And then you can imagine how pH may impact the mobility of these species in solution. So what are those next steps? The ESTCP program has funded a tech transfer program that's focused on per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances, the PFASs. I'm pleased to lead that effort. They have also, I believe, funded five ecotoxicology projects, one of which is listed here, uh, headed up by Chris Solis out at Tosin University. And there's a recently funded ESTCP project going to the Navy to use some of the fingerprinting tools we hear to do more detailed site investigation. So in conclusion, PFAS and P4 are very important species, but they're not the only major PFASs um, at AFFF contaminated sites. Telomer substances are present, and they do seem to be biodegrading, but to metastable intermediates under the conditions uh, prevailing in groundwater, but they do not form PFAS. And we do see enhanced mobility of ions in groundwater, so the anions and zwitter ions, but the cations may be forming source zones. And anion mobility depends on chain length and the geochemistry of soil and groundwater. So in terms of what are the benefits of this program and this research to the DOD, it is a recognition that there are hundreds of fire and crash testing sites spread across the DOD complex. Uh, there is a need for a full characterization of the PFAS contamination. I touched on these earlier. We need accurate conceptual site models. And we also need to identify remedial approaches that are going to embrace the totality of the substances that are out there, but in a cost-effective and time-effective manner. As we begin to understand the species that are there, we'd like to optimize the monitoring. And this is about proportioning resources um, appropriately. Fingerprinting may allow us to step to that next level of differentiating sources, including the possibility of identifying source zones. And then ultimately, we need better predictions of transport, possibly off-site, beyond the fence, and then to gather and improve our understanding of whether and to what degree in situ biotransformation is occurring. Lastly, groundwater contamination, as we understand here in the US and abroad, there is groundwater contamination due to AFFF use. And groundwater is recognized as a potential drinking water source. And as such, it's a potential exposure pathway for humans and wildlife. And we are going to have to shift our attention when we're thinking about uh, source water uh, treatment to the short chain PFASs because they're highly mobile and potentially difficult to remove from water. <laughs>
And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for joining us in this section of the webinar today. Thanks, Jennifer. We have received a number of questions from the audience. First, we had a clarifying question. Um, would you please confirm the conclusion that PFASs other than PFOS are present in the original AFFF at a greater percentage than PFOS? They can be. We have seen, I gave the example of a C6 sulfonate. We found one example where that is the case. So it's variable. I think what you have is a chemistry that was very variable over time. Got it. And then the next question was about PFNA in particular. Um, it was noted that in some early AFFF formulations, uh, they may have contained PFNA. Have you seen that in groundwater associated with these sites? And if so, what was its contribution? Well, that's a pretty detailed uh, question. Let's see. So in terms of AFFF, in our hands, the acids, the carboxylates, including PFOA and PFNA, are very low. They're minor. We do see them in groundwater, though. So we do see PFNA. We see acids all the way up to C10 and 11 in sites. Great, thanks. And is there any benefit for site characterization to measuring branched versus linear isomers of the PFASs, including PFOA and PFOS? Is there any advantage? I think it's more accurate. Um, to include and to embrace the fact we've got both branched and linear. So if you were to exclude branched, for example, you're missing up to 25% of the mass that's there. So it's, it's an accuracy question um, because they're both part of the same chemical. They're just isomers of one another. So I think you need to capture both branched and linear when they are present. And that's true for PFOS, the C6 sulfonate, Actually, that's a characteristic of the 3M chemistry, I, and so it's important to capture both. And what is known about the toxicology of the ultra-short C2 and C3 sulfonates? Well, since they were only recently identified, the unfortunate answer is we don't know much. The closest analogy we have is the C4 sulfonate. And there is uh, some limited information. It's interesting, there's also a super fun reference dose for the C4 sulfonate. And I would direct people to the state of Minnesota's website because they look more in depth on the, in the terms of the C4 PFBS. So that's our closest analogy. But, but no, there is really nothing to my knowledge on the ultra short C2s and C3s. Um, and how many and which PFASs do you recommend sampling for? I think that's going to depend on the question. Um, I think it's important to get it, and, and, or, or the, what you're trying to achieve. For example, if you're treating a drinking water source, I think you would really want to pay attention to make sure you're capturing the, the low end of the spectrum. If you're trying to do a full site assessment, um, you know, your objective may have to change. So I'm not sure there's any one magic list. I think there are sentinel species that could be giving you important information on exposure and pathways and sources. Uh, so I don't, I don't think there's any one magic answer. What I can say is if you're trying to fingerprint, let's say, sources based on what's in the method 537 list, that cast of characters includes a number of the sulfonates, three of them, a select number of carboxylates, and two acetic acids. What's challenging about that list, if you're trying to fingerprint a system, is one that doesn't have the ultra shorts. And the other is those species are common not only to AFFF sites, but you see them commonly in wastewater and landfills. So they're going to be, it's going to be harder to differentiate sources with a smaller number of PFASs. So it really depends on what your objective is. Sure. And the next question um, relates to that. It's about the commingling of plumes. At many sites, um, the PFASs are, are commingled um, in the groundwater, and there were so many AFFF formulations. Um, are there any case studies for differentiating AFFF sources at the sites? If the question is about sources, can, well, uh, okay, so often at fire training, Sarah, that is the activity that used AFFF. And then sites would purchase AFFF off the qualified products list. So the, all the materials used by the military meet the mil-spec qualification. 
those, some of those that made mail spec were then put on the qualified product list. So a base could be buying these materials and changing what they bought off that list over time. And so I would say when we look at uh, data, we often see evidence of 3M and Telomer within the same groundwater system. And that is this, this mixed purchasing and use over time. So if the question is about commingling of, of AFFF sources, uh, there's plenty of evidence that sites have used m different types of formulations over time. If you're talking about two different, if you've got a fire training saying intersecting with a municipal wastewater plume or a landfill plume, I, I think there are tools to differentiate those, but I'm not sure that was the question. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And in general, are, are telomer-based AFFF safer to use than the 3M PFOS-based AFFF? Well, that's an interesting question. As you heard the previous speaker talk about the potential for uh, removing uh, PFOS-based AFFF from the distribution systems, um, that's certainly um, you know, one goal. Um, are the telomeres base uh, uh, safer? Well, when we look and see very high levels, uh, milligram per liter levels of the telomer sulfonate that are derived from telomer-based materials, um, we basically lack information on the toxicity of the telomer sulfonate, both for human as well as ecotox. And so the problem is we're trying to compare something we have some data for against something which we don't have any data for, which makes it very, very uh, challenging. There are basically statements that if you use a telomer-based um, AFFF, um, that, that those products do not turn into chemicals that are listed in the Stockholm Convention. Strictly speaking, that's true because they don't contain PFOS and they don't degrade to PFOS. However, um, I recently noticed that in March of 2015, the EU is proposing listing PFOA on the Stockholm Convention. And so I think we can't preclude um, the possibility that telomer-based may uh, be connected to the net production of PFOA in groundwater. So that's actually a difficult question to, to, to answer. Jennifer, can you expand on um, or provide some information on which labs are available to analyze the PFASs and, and how formalized the methods are for that analysis? Well, we're actually working with uh, Janice Wiley of the DOD Accreditation Lab to uh, coordinate, and that's part of the ESTCP tech transfer um, project that we're involved in, is to reach out and coordinate information with the labs who currently provide or want to provide PFAS analyses in the future. And so those labs, I think, are, are fairly well known. There's a number of them, both in the U.S. and Canada and abroad, and, and they're not that difficult to find. And I'm, I'm you know, not going to advocate for, for one or the other, but there's a lot of talent out there, and there's a lot of data being generated by these laboratories. So they're definitely present, and they're definitely capable. Um, and you know, as a consumer of the information, I think conversations with those laboratories and what they do and how they do it and how they're staying up with the information, um, that, that's a conversation I think you should have if you are engaging these laboratories either as a remedial project manager or a consultant in assistance uh, to those groups. We have time for one last question. Um, would you please expand and clarify on um, what you meant by cation exchange may create immobile source zones? Well, in these batch sorption experiments, we see that the cationic portions of those AFFF are completely bound to sediment. There's nothing remaining in water. And that's how you go about understanding absorption. You look at the ratio of what's in the sediment to what's on the water. So compared to the anions and zwitter ions, uh, they partition. There's some in the water and some on the sediment. The cations are all on the sediment. And so I think it's going to depend a little bit on site property uh, conditions. But the cations and cation exchange is a strong interaction, a strong intermolecular interaction that may relatively tightly bind cations near the site of discharge or disposal, unlike anions, which can be repelled by uh, electrostatic interactions with anionic organic matter. In other words, those cations have a different mechanism that may be quite strong that would lead to their retention near the site of disposal. Okay, thank you very much, Jennifer, for an informative presentation and answering so many questions. Um, Jennifer will return at the end of the seminar to answer a few more of your questions. At this time, we'll move on to our second, or our final presentation, excuse, excuse me, the third one. And that will be given by Dr. Patrick Evans, who's a Vice President with CDM Smith in, uh, in Washington. And uh, Pat received his PhD in Chemical Engineering from the University of Michigan, 
and has over 25 years of research and development experience. He's the recipient of numerous awards, including a Superior Achievement Award from the American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists. His work on 1,4-dioxane began in the early 1990s when he developed and demonstrated bioreactors for ex situ treatment of groundwater. Pat? Thank you very much, Jennifer. It's a pleasure to be here. Hello, everyone. And so we're going to start off by giving you a little bit of background on dioxane, talking about some of its properties and what it is and, and why we care about it. And then we're going to get into some of the technical challenges that are associated with the remediation of dioxane that result because of these physical and chemical properties. We're going to then go into some snapshots of research that has been funded by CERTIP and ESTCP and others that address these specific technical challenges with a focus on work that we've done in terms of looking at slow release chemical accidents for treatment of dioxane. And hopefully at the end, we're going to answer Chicken Little's question of whether the sky is really falling or not. And so, well, dioxane is both a solvent and a solvent stabilizer. It's used as a solvent in the manufacture of certain uh, plastics like PET, which is used for your soda pop bottles. It's also used as a stabilizer for certain solvents such as 111 trichloroethane or TCA. It has a boiling point close to water and a vapor pressure that's about the same order of magnitude as trichloroethane. However, unlike trichloroethane, it has a low KOW, which means it doesn't stick to uh, organic materials very well. It's completely soluble in water, and because of that solubility, it has a very low Henry constant. And so these physical properties and chemical properties have specific uh, effects on the transport of dioxane through groundwater and soil, and then also in terms of treatment of dioxane. So, but before we get into the technologies and, and looking at how these physical and chemical properties affect the uh, treatment of dioxane, let's take a look a little bit about where do we find dioxane. And Hunter Anderson has uh, done a lot of research with the Air Force looking at the occurrence and co-occurrence of dioxane with different chlorinated solvents. And what he's been able to show is that you sometimes see that dioxane is associated with TCE and its daughter products, and exclusively with TCE and its daughter products, as shown as this part of this Venn diagram, and also shown as this part of this pie chart. Sometimes dioxane is found in wells that have TCA and its daughter products. And then, but most of the time, Dioxane is found in wells that have a mixture of different chlorinated solvents, as shown by all of these intersections, and shown by this part of the pie chart, this part, and this part. Sometimes dioxane is found by itself, but that isn't most of the case. And so what does this tell us? It tells us a couple of things. One, if you have chlorinated solvents and you haven't looked for dioxane, you probably should. Hunter estimates that it's maybe about 25% of wells contain chlorinated solvents also contain dioxane. But this may be a low estimate because quite often we're not analyzing for dioxane. And so the problem may be bigger than we currently know. The other thing to know is that if you have TCE and nothing else, or TCE and cis-TCE and vinyl chloride, that doesn't mean you shouldn't be looking for dioxane. You definitely should be looking for it because it may be there. And so that's a big part of the site characterization. So, but why, why do we care about dioxane? Well, the reason is because EPA has classified it as a profitable carcinogen. If you take a look at its slope factor that's been published and you look at the excess 10 to the minus 6 cancer risk, it translates into a drinking water equivalence level of 0.35 parts per billion. So that's pretty low. Now, the EPA hasn't established an MCL for dioxane, but it is on the unregulated contaminant monitoring rule list number three, which means that drinking water utilities are required to monitor and report dioxane detections in their drinking water supplies. Now, that's the status with the EPA right now. They're researching the extent of the, the impact. But states, some states have MCLs, and the guidelines in states vary quite a bit. Uh, but the dioxane that's present in water and in soil is only part of the picture. 
We also know that dioxane is present in cosmetics. It's been found in baby shampoo. This is changing now with because of certain organizations such as the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics. But of course the dioxane in water and in soil is only part of the entire risk picture. So well, let's go ahead and get into the treatment of dioxane. And so what can you do about it? Well, you can't strip it very well because of that low Henry's constant. You can't absorb it very well. It's, you can absorb it a little bit. Turns out that there are certain uh, MAC porous uh, resins, such as Amberzorb, that can absorb dioxane. And there are some technologies out there for doing uh, absorption of uh, pump and treated dioxane, including uh, regeneration of that uh, resin. And this is great because it's an alternative to what is most typically used in pump and treat system, which are advanced oxidation processes. And the problem with advanced oxidation in pump and treat is one, is you have to pump and treat forever. And then two, advanced oxidation processes are very expensive, both from a capital and an operating expense. So what can I do as an alternative to pump and treat? Well, first let's take a look at if dioxane is soil. And you may not have thought of dioxane being present in soil, but just like TCE, TCA, chlorinated solvents, uh, dioxane can be present in the soil as well. And if you go ahead and you do your standard soil for extraction, it's not going to work very well. Why? Because of that low Henry's constant. It stays associated with the soil moisture that's present. Now, Rob Hinchy has come up with an innovative technology here called extreme soil vapor extraction. And what he's doing there is using a combination of high airflow and high vacuum to effectively desiccate the soil. And so now we can take advantage of that high vapor pressure of the dioxane and remove it from the soil. And what he's shown so far, and while the results aren't published yet, he's found that he's been able to remove all of the dioxane that he estimated to be present in the soil. Uh, there are always certain uh, uncertainties with those estimates, but still this is a great uh, result and gives us a technology for dealing with dioxane in vagosone soil. But what about in groundwater? That's typically what we're thinking about. And we've used a lot of different technologies for treating chlorinated solvents in groundwater, like bioremediation, in-situ chemical oxidation, thermal treatment. So what about bioremediation? Can we apply that to dioxane? Well, the first question you have to ask is, is dioxane biodegradable? Can it be biodegraded? And the answer is yes. Over 20 years ago, Becky Perales and Gene Adamus discovered the first bacterium that was capable of using dioxane as its sole source of carbon and energy for growth. And this was called CB1190. And so, but even before this, it was known that dioxane could be biodegraded. At the Lowry Landfill in Colorado, it was found that in a landfill leachate where there was tetrahydrofuran, another cyclic ether, uh, was present uh, along with dioxane, found out that dioxane was biodegraded in a bioreactor. What is thought to have happened there is that the THF was being biodegraded and it was acting as a co-metabolite for degradation of the dioxane. This work here done by Becky and Jean actually started off with a mixed culture growing on THF and dioxane that was then weaned away from the THF and resulting in the isolation of this bacterium. And so we have a couple of different mechanisms for degrading dioxane, but this was just the start. So CERTIP started uh, investing in research on looking at biodegradation of dioxane. A couple of groups were uh, um, funded for that. Lisa Alvarez-Cohen and Rob Steffen were the PIs on this, assisted by Shaley Mahendra and Paul Hatzinger. And in this, they identified and isolated the number of different bacteria, including the CB1190. They determined that they, uh, certain of these bacteria were capable of degrading dioxane, but sometimes the degradation didn't occur at all. Uh, they found that co-metabolism uh, did occur, and what was common to these bacteria that did the co-metabolism was they all had the monooxygenase enzyme. And so what this demonstrated is that natural attenuation might be possible, but it might be slow. Co-metabolism can definitely be done. And then in addition to that, they also 
looked at the pathways and determined what those pathways for the degradation of dioxane were, and there were several, and they identified the genes associated with the pathways, and they developed some different genetic tools that were capable of uh, being used to identify whether those bacteria are present in the groundwater of the soil. So then since then, Mike Hyman had done work looking at co-metabolism of dioxane. And he specifically looked at isobutane and isobutene, some branched hydrocarbons, to see if they could promote the co-metabolism of dioxane. He found out that this worked out quite well. But what he also found out is that there was inconsistent uh, degradation of the chlorinated solvents. And so as we know from Hunter's work, dioxane is also associated with these chlorinated solvents. So we need to have a co-metabolism approach that's going to address all of the problems. And so what uh, Mike has found is that we need to look very carefully at which co-metabolites we use and to make sure that they address the entire problem. Now, Charles Schaefer and Paul Hatzinger took a bit of a different approach and it's pretty interesting. If we have a source area that has chlorinated solvents and we employ enhanced anaerobic bioremediation under anaerobic conditions to degrade the chlorinated solvents, then we're going to be generating dissolved methane. That dissolved methane can transport down gradient, and dioxane isn't known to be degraded anaerobically. But maybe down gradient, that methane could get into the microaerophilic or aerobic fringes of that plume, and with that can go ahead and degrade the dioxane by co-metabolism. And so the idea with that was that this methane will promote that methane monooxygenase and degrade the dioxane. Well, it was a great hypothesis, but it turned out to be wrong. They found out that the methane was not uh, promoting dioxane degradation at all. But it all was not lost. They did find that ethane and propane did promote the co-metabolism of dioxane, and that ethane is also a degradation product of reductive dechlorination of TCA and TCE. And so this still has a lot of potential. The big picture here is that all co-metabolites are not equal, and you have to look at which ones are specifically uh, applicable to your site in order to be able to solve the problem. Now, Dave Adamson, he took a little bit of a bigger picture approach looking at doxane plumes. It used to be thought that doxane plumes were all very large and very dilute. Uh, so Dave has somewhat busted that myth and found out that some plumes, yes, that is the case, dioxane plumes are longer than the chlorinated solvent plumes, but in other plumes they're the same size, in other plumes the dioxane is, is smaller. What he's also found is that MNA actually occurs with reasonable half-lives. We're talking about half-lives that are in the order of decades rather than centuries. So the dioxane is going away but we can't anticipate it to be going away in a period of years. It still is going to take a while. And part of that is because dioxane does back diffuse, just like TCE and TCA. And so we might be finding that these dioxane sites are a little bit more manageable and not completely uh, difficult to treat. Doesn't mean that they're easy, though. Now, Pedro Alvarez has gone ahead and, and built upon the work that is done by others and uh, identifying pathways. And he's been able to look at a number of different genetic tools or probes uh, for looking at the presence of these uh, putative dioxane degraders in the groundwater, in the soil. And he's been able to correlate that to the rate of dioxane degradation. The correlation, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good over several orders of magnitude. And so what he's shown is that these biomarkers for monooxygenases can possibly be used as a tool to track uh, dioxane biodegradation. However, we need to make sure that we take into account that just because the bacteria are there doesn't mean that they're active. And so we need to have the right environmental conditions for these bacteria, make sure that these genes are being expressed, we're producing the enzymes to degrade the dioxane, and that the enzymes are actually active. So how can we determine whether the dioxane is actually being biodegraded or, or chemically oxidated? Well, compound-specific isotope analysis has been a technology that's used, and Paul Yaroshek talked about perchlorate. Well, CSIA was the technique that was used to distinguish naturally occurring perchlorate from anthropogenic perchlorate. 
Well, this technique is, is great, and it looks at the ability of certain contaminants to be, whether they're being degraded or they're just being transported by dispersion and dilution. And this technique has a lot of power, but the challenge of using this with dioxane is that these dioxane concentrations are typically quite low, and you need a certain minimum mass for these mass specs to work in doing the CSIA analysis. So he's using these same resins that are used for that pump and treat system with the regenerable resin to absorb the dioxane and provide enough mass to do this technique. This research is just starting, so it has promise, and we'll be staying tuned for that. Okay, so now Shaley Mahendra has been looking at uh, what happens in the groundwater and what's the effect of certain metals in chlorinated solvents. I mentioned that just because the bacteria are there or the genes are there doesn't mean that they're necessarily active. And so she's looking at the effect of metals and chlorinated solvents and the potential for them to inhibit dioxane degradation. They may even, uh, metals may even enhance the degradation of dioxane because they may be present as, as cofactors for certain enzymes. She has found that biodegradation can be inhibited by certain metals such as copper, which is known to be able to be inhibit certain bacteria. And so this knowledge is really important because it allows us to take a number of different lines of evidence to say whether we have MNA. We can use the gene probes to say whether the bacteria are there, and we can use environmental indicators such as this to say whether the environmental conditions are correct or appropriate for degradation of dioxane. Now, if we take a look at some of the work that's been done by Tom DeCristina, it's pretty interesting. So he's been taking a look at metals and specifically iron and their ability to be reduced by iron reducing bacteria such as the strange Shuanella. And what he's found is that when he goes ahead and he takes these bacteria and reduces the ferric iron into ferrous iron, and then that ferrous iron is reoxidized into ferric iron, he finds that free radicals, specifically hydroxyl radicals, are produced, and these are capable of degrading dioxane. I find this very fascinating uh, in terms of this interaction between chemistry and microbiology. And so, but you may ask, well, how could this be applied in, in the field? Well, just like Paul Hatzinger and Charles Schaefer were looking at the potential of that methane to be oxidized and produce methane monooxygenase at the aerobic fringes of the plume, well, that could possibly be happening here because at the fringes of these plume, we, plume, we have both temporal and spatial variations in oxygen concentrations, and so we could anticipate that this may be happening. So far, he's been just testing this in the lab, but we'll see what happens in the field. This may also have applications to pump and treat and have more cost advantages than, say, uh, looking at something like uh, advanced oxidation. Now, if we take a look at straight ISCO and we move away from the bacteria, we find that their ISCO definitely can degrade dioxane, but ISCO has certain disadvantages in terms of it doesn't stick around very long, and we know now that dioxane can back diffuse out of low permeability media, just like chlorinated solvents. And so we may have a long-term problem that we have to deal with. So how can we use ISCO to solve that problem? Well, one way that Ken Carroll is doing that is looking at different oxidant combinations, different ways of stabilizing oxidants in order to make them stick around longer and to address the dioxane plume. And this leads into the work that I'm doing in uh, collaboration with Pamela Dugan and Michelle Creamy. We're looking at slow-release chemical oxidants. And the idea here is that we may have dioxane plumes that last for decades. And we may have to have a passive management strategy that can go ahead and treat that dioxane and prevent it from going off site or for meeting, meeting remediation goals. And so what we've been doing is looking at permanganate and also persulfate without any activators to be able to be slowly released from a uh, slow release platform and to then go ahead and uh, sustainably degrade dioxane, but not just dioxane, also chlorinated solvents and maybe even other chemicals. So the way this works is that we have permanganate or persulfate that is impregnated into a wax cylinder. 
the mass of the oxidant that's present in the cylinder is, is 70, 80% or so, it depends on the oxidant. And then these cylinders can either be put into wells or be put into direct push, or we can even use them in other types of configurations, such as permeable reactive barriers or funnel and gate scenarios. And so then once we put that cylinder into the groundwater, what happens? Well, this is a photograph right here of a cylinder that contains permanganate, which gives it its dark color. And then here's just a representation of that cylinder, a cross-section of it, showing the permanganate here and then the white parts of the wax. When we go ahead and we put this into the groundwater, the first thing that happens is that this permanganate starts to dissolve into the groundwater. And so we get some consumption of this. We see a spike of the permanganate or the persulfate into the groundwater. And that permanganate or persulfate starts oxidizing our contaminants, dioxide, and chlorinated solvents, what have you. As time goes on, we're going to see consumption of that oxidant within the cylinder. And we're going to see a distance here between the edge of the cylinder, this wax matrix is still in place, and where the residual perchlorate solid or the residual uh, permanganate or persulfate is, and this results, results in a diffusional mass transfer distance that provides these cylinders with the slow release characteristics. Eventually, we're going to see that the oxidant is completely consumed. We end up having an inert wax cylinder that if it's in a well or a permeable reactive barrier, we can take that out. Or if it's in put in with direct push, we can go ahead and, and put something in right next door. So well, how well do these, these uh, oxidants work? Do we get high enough concentrations of the oxidants to be able to destroy uh, dioxane? And does it work with mixed contaminant plumes? And the answer is it works quite well. On the left here, we're looking at percent removal of dioxane in the uh, triangles. Initially in this study using soil and groundwater from Naval Air Station North Island, we found out that it wasn't working quite well. But it turned out that we hadn't exactly matched the kinetics of the uh, system uh, with the ability of the persulfate to oxidize dioxane. Once we solved that and identified that, we found that we were able to get 90, 99% removal of dioxane. And so this was a very good result, and this was sustainable for a period of, of several months, and then we stopped the experiment. Looking at chlorinated ethene, such as TCE, we find it works even better because the reaction kinetics are even greater. We found out that we were able to get 99.9% .9 removal, or even more, because the TCE and other chlorinateds were non-detectable. When we started out with concentrations, we're in the PPM levels. So this worked out very well, and this provides a nice uh, lead-in for us going out to the field at Naval Air Station North Island, where the system is currently being installed, and we're going to be starting this up here at the end of this year. So what we find uh, from this research that's been done by a group of uh, different investigators in different groups is that dioxane, it is more widespread than uh, previously thought. Uh, and it may be uh, more widespread than we know today. If you have chlorinated solvents uh, present at your site and you haven't analyzed for dioxane, you probably should. And you may find that you've got uh, some problems that you need to deal with. Now, does that mean that the sky is falling? Well, you may be depressed for a day. But because of this research, there are a number of tools that have been developed and are ready for use and other tools that are currently developed. And these include tools that can be used for site characterization, for remediation, or for determining whether MNA is appropriate for your site. These uh, tools and alternatives address things such as treatment of soil containing uh, dioxane, also in groundwater, looking at co-metabolism or direct metabolism of, of dioxane, different ISCO methods such as the slow release chemical oxidants, and looking at monitor natural attenuation, which has some promise for uh, degradation of dioxane, however, does require some investigation and definitely isn't as simple as natural attenuation of BTEX. So with that, I hope you found this uh, presentation useful. And at this point, I'll hand it back over to Jennifer and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pat.
The first question is, what groundwater analytical method for 1,4-dioxane do you recommend for an initial characterization at chlorinated solvent sites? There are several methods uh, that can be used. Uh, you can use uh, 8260, 8270 for initial characterization. Uh, but if you want to get to the really low concentration, there are some EPA Series 500 uh, uh, methods that can get down to below PPB levels. It really depends on what uh, your, your state regulatory uh, threshold is, what you need to be aiming for, and what potential interferences you may have with those. And can you um, provide any information about what regulatory standards or guidance out there at the national or state level for 1,4-dioxane? At the national level, there uh, is no standard so far. The uh, closest thing is this uh, risk, uh, the, the slope factor for dioxane, which could be used to calculate a drinking water equivalence level of 0.3 ppb. However, uh, I do not believe that DWEL has been specifically published. The EPA is currently evaluating it and has not uh, determined whether to establish an MCL for dioxane or not. It's investigating it. On the state level, it varies quite widely. Uh, you'll see certain places, such as California and Massachusetts, where the MCLs are on the order of one or three parts per billion. Other states with HAT, which have no regulations or just have health advisories. And so you really have to look at the specific state uh, regulations and see what they, what they have for that. Okay. And for a site where a pump and treat remedy is already in place for chlorinated solvents, what do you suggest for an additional treatment um, for 1,4-dioxane? Yes. So if you have a pump and treat, uh, and, and that's probably going to involve something like uh, carbon adsorption or maybe air stripping, but then what I would suggest is uh, looking at uh, two different things. One. Go ahead and see what the, you're going to need to do to add on to that treatment system in terms of an advanced oxidation process or a regenerable resin process. And look at what the capital and operating costs for, for dealing with that are. Right? And then at the same time, start looking at in situ remedies that can address the dioxane in the groundwater and then also address the chlorinated solvents, so eventually you can go ahead and shut that pump and treat system off. Okay, and with respect to um, the sources of 1,4-dioxane, I believe there was some previous research that concluded um, the overwhelming use of 1,4-dioxane was as a solvent stabilizer, and does your experience support that conclusion? So it depends on, on where you are. Uh, so for example, there are some plastics manufacturers in, in the Carolinas where uh, dioxane was used predominantly as a solvent. Uh, dioxane was also used uh, in the Ann Arbor, Michigan area by the Gelman Corporation for making uh, filters, and that's resulted in, I believe, the largest pump and treat advanced oxidation system in the world currently for treating this dioxane plume. Uh, however, they are uh, the, the person ans asking the question is correct that dioxane was widely used as a solvent stabilizer. Most people think of dioxane being used as a solvent stabilizer for 111 trichloroethane. That is known. And uh, in the 70s, uh, when the uh, uh, ozone depletion regulations came in, in place and we got rid of dioxane or got rid of TCA and went back to TCE, then there wasn't dioxane being used at that time. And so we believe that dioxane wasn't used as a stabilizer for TCE. However, if we take a look at what Hunter Anderson has researched, he's found that there are mill specs back in the 40s and the 50s for TCA, TCE that call for inhibitors being used in TCE. Now, we don't know what those inhibitors were, but it's possible that dioxane could have been used then. Okay, and what about 1,4-dioxane in soil? Um, is is 1,4-dioxane in soil a concern, and has research been conducted on treatment of 1,4-dioxane in soil? <laughs> 
there, people generally don't look for dioxane in soil, uh, based on my experience. Uh, actually, personally, I only know of one site uh, where dioxane has been discovered in soil. And, uh, and then the work that's being done by Rob Hinchy, you know, he's developed an, a technique for treating dioxane in soil called this extreme soil vapor extraction. I think if you have chlorinated solvents in your soil, just like in groundwater, you should definitely be looking for dioxane there. And in terms of the remediation technologies, there is, of course, always the dig and haul, which we don't like, but sometimes for a hot spot, that may make the most sense. There is the extreme soil vapor extraction. Uh, but if your soil is already dry and has a very low moisture content, you may be able to use regular soil vapor extraction. So you have to really do uh, some calculations, maybe even a pilot test, to see whether that's going to work. And then, while people haven't looked at this too much, co-metabolism uh, of dioxane in the soil may be uh, useful. Just as the work that uh, we've previously done looking at gaseous electron donor injection technology, you could go ahead and be injecting compounds such as propane or maybe ethane, maybe even isobutane, along with some air and be promoting the co-metabolism of dioxane and at the same time of your chlorinated ethanes. Thanks, Pat. And the next questions are about the slow release oxidant. Um, the first is how quickly does the oxidant release from the wax? How long does it, it last? How quickly does it release from the from the wax? Is it days or months ah. or years? And and I think that gets yes. to the to what you said, how how persistent is it? Yes. So we have uh, done some measurements of, of the uh, release rate, and we don't have a, a, an accurate handle on that because it seems to be affected by a number of different factors. But it looks like it's uh, about 10 milligrams per square centimeter per day. Uh, actually, I don't think I have the units right on that, so I apologize for that. But getting to the bottom line is, is how long do these cylinders last? And we anticipate that they're going to last anywhere from about six months to about two years. Now, this is highly uncertain, and part of our demonstration is going to evaluate that. And it really depends on which oxidant you look at. So for example, persulfate, when you put that into the ground, that's going to dissolve into the groundwater. And we find initially a slow release rate, and then that release rate increases over time. This, we don't know exactly why. It could be because the, the wax matrix is being disturbed over time as the uh, persulfate is being released. Uh, but that's, that's one way. And, and so we may see, for example, a year or two years that that cylinder lasts. If we look at permanganate, it's a completely different picture. When we did our studies at Naval Air Station North Island in the laboratory, we found that on the outside of the cylinder, manganese dioxide coating was formed. And this slowed the release rate of permanganate from the cylinders and resulted in it not working very well for dioxane. Well, it actually worked quite well for the chlorinated ethenes. Why? Because the chlorinated ethene reaction rates are much greater. And so this manganese dioxide coating on the outside of the cylinders may be in some ways a blessing. It may control the release rate and allow the cylinders to last longer. And that may be good for chlorinated solvents. Whether it's good for dioxane or not really depends a lot on your concentrations of dioxane present in your groundwater, the geochemistry of the groundwater, what the groundwater flow rate is, and what the cleanup uh, levels are for dioxane. Okay, thank you, Pat. Thanks for answering the questions and for your very informative presentation. And at this time, we'd like to bring Paul and Jennifer back for some questions. And the first question is specific um, to Paul. The question is, will closed sites, for example, those with a no further action determination or with a rod in place, be reopened to implement emerging contaminant actions? The answer is possibly, and let me tell you where that would occur. We typically do um, CERCLA five-year looks at the site to ensure protectiveness. 
And during that five-year review, if uh, there were a new contaminant at the site or if there were a new toxicity value and a new standard for a contaminant, it is possible that the site could be reopened. Thanks, Paul. And the next question is for all three of our speakers. Why are these chemicals like PFOS, PFON, 1,4-Dioxane considered to be emerging now? What has made them emerge in the last few years? Um, we'll start with Jennifer, please. Well, in the case of the PFASs, these are anionic materials at environmental and physiological pHs. So our tools for detecting the classic um, pollutants like TCE and BTEX compounds, the tool we used was gas chromatography, and that's very suitable to TCE and things like benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene because they're volatile. But in the case of PFASs, they're anionic. They do not go into the gas phase. So basically, it, it came... Uh, these came into uh, to our attention as the LCMS, the liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry, developed. Uh, and it was only then that we could actually see these chemicals. So they've been there the whole time. You just couldn't see them using the early analytical approaches that were based on GCMS. Okay. And Pat, do you have a, a, any information to add with respect to 1,4-Dioxane? Sure, and, and I think the, the, what I have to add it applies to most, if not all, emerging contaminants that are found in groundwater. It's really a combination of analytical techniques, such as Jennifer has mentioned, as well as the, uh, the, the risk awareness and determining what the, the human health and environmental risk and what the regulatory requirements are. If we take a look back at perchlorate, we didn't realize that perchlorate was present in groundwater until we developed an analytical technique that was capable of detecting it at part per billion uh, uh, concentrations. And in one case, uh, an industry was going ahead and doing pump and treat for TCE in groundwater, and they were doing a great job of removing TCE from the groundwater and then using that treated water to spray irrigate land. Well, it turned out that that water contained perchlorate, but it wasn't known at the time, and this created a bigger problem for that particular company. And so now, so one, what we need to determine is look forward, and I think uh, Paul will have a lot of comments on that in terms of how low we can go with analytical techniques, and, and is there a bottom? Yeah, Jennifer, I'd like that. I, I think there's really a simple answer to what makes it an emerging contaminant. And if you look at the definition we provided early in the slides, if, if the science is changing and, for example, there's going to be a, a toxicology a value produced for that, that's one of the things that makes it an, an emerging contaminant. And, and we follow very closely what's in the EPA's IRIS pipeline, what priority chemicals EPA is putting on their TOSCA list, and also uh, worldwide, we follow what chemicals are being applied to the substances of a very high concern on REACH, the European regulation. So all, all of those things help us determine what's an emerging contaminant. Thank you very much. And, and we have just time for one more question and just one minute left. Um, what do you think is the most um, significant challenge, or which, which emerging contaminant is currently presenting the most significant challenge? And we'll go around just quickly. Uh, Paul? Ooh, wow, we have a bunch. <laughs> um, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move out of the cleanup arena for a minute. Uh, I, I think some of the flame retardants right now um, are, are on our list because we use them so much in the Department of Defense in protecting our combat systems. Um, we just recently were, were notified by EPA that they may take regulatory action on a family of chemicals called chlorinated paraffins. And um, the chlorinated paraffins are used in cutting fluids, and they, they're used in the manufacturing process for many, many of the things we buy. So I guess I would put some of the flame retardants and chlorinated paraffins right at the top of our list right now. Okay, and Jennifer, do you agree? Well, I'm not an expert in that area. I, I just recognize the challenges that, that having a growing number of PFASs presents, and especially with uh, remedial site managers who are trying to make decisions on uh, source water and treatment, there, there's, there's a whole bunch of problems just within that class itself. So it, it's definitely going to be up there in terms of challenges. Okay, and Pat. 
I think the most challenging emerging contaminants is where it's not one contaminant, but rather it's a mixture. And the uh, perfluorinated, polyfluorinated falls into that group very cleanly. Another whole group is looking at pharmaceuticals and personal care products, microconstituents that are present in groundwater and drinking water and uh, drinking water supplies. Jen, I would just mention one more that occurred to me because it's of, of uh, concern to the cleanup pro uh, program. And that is um, EPA just put out uh, a PPRTV um, for soluble tungsten. So that clearly has appeared on our radar screen now. We've been watching tungsten and tungsten products for a while, but now that this PPRTV came out on soluble tungsten, it, it, it's certainly something worth watching. Okay. Thank you all. And I would like to thank all of our speakers for an excellent and informative uh, webinar. The next um, webinar is on December 17th, and that will highlight watershed assessment and stormwater management optimization tools. And before we conclude, I would like to remind you that both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on our webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. And we would um, appreciate it if you would please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen at this time. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you. <laughs>